So welcome everyone. My name is Jessica Lorai. I'm the program director at the Interfaith Center at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And at the Interfaith Center, our mission is to invite people from diverse secular, spiritual, and religious traditions to participate in one another's practices in order to cultivate appreciative understanding and friendship. We seek to unify people around common moral, social, and ethical concerns in order to build a more just and equitable society. So tonight I'm really happy to introduce our guest. Her name is Linda Mercadante and Linda's going to be talking about spiritual but not religious. So SBNR is a um, abbreviation of spiritual but not religious and this movement is the hottest religious news in decades. Although the US was once the most devout nation in the industrialized West, now religious affiliation is rapidly declining. In order to make sense of this, we will consider who are the SBNRs, what do they believe, and what might this mean for the United States? So Linda is a distinguished research professor emerita at the Methodist Theological School of Ohio and founder of healthybeliefs.org. She focuses on the intersection of belief and culture, especially in the spiritual but not religious movement. She's the author of five books and hundreds of articles, and her most recent is the award-winning Belief Without Borders, Inside the Minds of the Spiritual but Not Religious. As an internationally known speaker, she's been featured on NBC's The Today Show, The New York Times, WOSU, and many other media outlets. So I'm really excited to have Linda here with us tonight. And Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can tell us all about SBNRs. Oh, you are muted, Linda. Um, I'm not getting the, I'm only getting my share screen right now. Can you take that off and just have it, you know, the uh, all the faces. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear. We, we have it on speaker view. So when you're speaking, your image is the one that's visible, even though it may not appear that way to you. So, okay. yeah. Well, to me, I have my slides and eventually when I'm done with them, we I need to get out of shared screen. Sorry to start with business. That's OK. OK. Well, anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, this is my specialty that I'm very interested in. And um, I want to start with uh, us knowing a little bit about the country, because unless we know where we've been, it won't be surprising where we're going. And it is surprising where we're going. So I just want to clarify the U.S. situation. Um, and in fact, America is still the most devout uh, nation of, uh, of the other in industrialized Western countries, which given the topic here, you would think, no, no, that's gone. But in fact, 36% of Americans say they get a great deal of satisfaction and meaning and fulfillment out of their religious practice. And for actually for Blacks and Hispanics, it's very high. It's about 75%. So you might think, well, then what's the big problem? <clears throat> I wanted to, to uh, remind you, for starters, why people get so much satisfaction out of their uh, beliefs. <sighs> there. Okay, so... These are the top reasons that U.S. adults give for attending religious services. You can see here, I'll use my cursor here. Um, you can see that to become closer to God is very high on their list. <clears throat> so, um, so their children will have a moral foundation to make themselves a better person and for comfort in times of sorrow and trouble. So, uh, Linda, just, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We cannot see your shared screen. Oh, can you? Um, sorry about that. And that's all, and Jessica, that's all I see. How can we back out of that and then go back and um, go back and uh, unshare it and then share it? Can we do that? Because my computer is not cooperating here. Sorry about that. See, I just see my slides. That's all I see. Okay. Um we don't have them showing at all. At the very bottom of your screen, do you see a green button that says share screen? 
No, because um, it's it's not showing me any Zoom. It's uh, I'm sorry to take up the business, but instead of Zoom, I'm getting um, I'm getting just uh, Face uh, PowerPoint is all I'm getting. I think just uh, you can uh, minimize the, your PowerPoint and okay. All yeah, right. and then you will be able to see the Zoom, and there will, will be the option to share a screen so you can share. Okay. Minimize. Right, I did that already. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh dear, I I can't see. Uh, all my Zoom controls are are gone. Sorry, except for the video of myself. I'm really sorry about this. That's okay. Uh, I've see, had I've had similar issues in the past, and sometimes it's a need to update to the latest version of Zoom. Um, it could be that. Uh, if you'd like, you can feel free to read them to us. Yeah. Well, I also I went out of it. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I guess I'll do that. But you can see me, right? Yes. Okay. All right, so anyway, um, I, I was checking on why people attend services. And they do it to become closer to God, to give their children a moral foundation, and to make themselves a better person. And then, of course, comfort in times of sorrow and trouble. So that sounds good. That sounds like America. It sounds like um, shouldn't everybody be there? And in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, that, that is where the majority of the population were. Not a particular religion, but religion, organized religion. But now the numbers are declining. And I have a chart here that you would probably be very interested in if you could see it. <clears throat> but at any rate, in 1940 and pr previous, about uh, over 70%, more like, I think in the 30s, it was even higher. But anyway, it was about 73% were church members. So maybe more went, but they were members. By 2000, by 2020, it had dropped to 47 percent. So from 73 to 47 is a huge drop, and it's for statistical purposes, it's not that long of a period. So that is a huge decline. Um, now I, I wanted to show you a slide about America's changing religious landscape, and it, if I could show it to you, you would see that in 1970, about um, a huge percentage of Americans were in organized religion. And if you could see this line, it drops like this. So you can see that it goes down, down, down. And then the line for no religion starts out very low and it goes higher and higher and higher, which is unexpected actually. So America's changing drastically. It's just that um, people that are still sitting in the pews probably notice less and less people around them. But a lot of people that um, are not regular churchgoers or religion participants, they may not notice it. But it's very dramatic and statistically speaking, a first time thing for us in America. So <clears throat> um, the majority now are not affiliated. This is this is new. And churches are kind of panicking. I have a, a, a billboard up here <clears throat> that says, um, and it's put out by a church, and it says, not religious, neither are we, which is crazy because it's a church. <clears throat> but churches are going out of their way to try to find things they can do to attract people that are unaffiliated or that call themselves spiritual but not religious. But I can tell you from experience, it's not working that well. <clears throat> so churches are kind of panicking, really. They're trying lots of things, um, but they're not, um, unfortunately, working. <clears throat> Another slide I have is the percentage of each generation that is religious unaffiliate uh, that are religiously unaffiliated. Now, um, at, I wish I could draw <laughs> draw this for you, but anyway, the millennials are they had the chart is from about 1990 to 2018. And the millennials start pretty unaffiliated, but their unaffiliation rises, which is amazing that for pretty unaffiliated people, they got even more unaffiliated. As far as Gen X, they also dropped. Uh, boomers dropped, the silent generation, that's the 1950s people. 
and the greatest generation. The greatest generation is the only generation whose affiliation did not drop in the population. Um, so it for those people in the religious world, this is very disturbing. They know about it and they're upset. So what about gender? Are women more unaffiliated? You know, it, for, for a lot of time, years, people thought that women were more religious than men. And I, that is still kind of true. But you can see, well, you could see if you saw a chart, but you can't see it. Okay. That um, uh, men started out less affiliated, but still fairly affiliated, and their numbers rose, and women's numbers rose right alongside theirs. There may be a 10%, 20% change in them, but they're both going up like that. So why right why well um the the uh, pew research center which i really like a lot it's an excellent research center and you can go to pew and look these things up <clears throat> anyway they get they they surveyed people and they gave they found the uh, top reasons that u.s adults don't go to services and and here's what they are the top one was i practice my faith in other ways 37 percent of the unaffiliated said that now this is including everybody, agnostics, atheists, everybody that's unaffiliated. <clears throat> we haven't come to spiritual but not religious yet, but we will. 28% um, said, I am not a believer. And 23% said, I haven't found a church or a house of worship that I like. So presumably those people might still be looking, but I don't know that that's really what's happening. <clears throat> so no matter what we say or how we explain it, the, the idea of no religion is dramatically increasing. Now, I wanted to break this down for you. Start with who, there are religious people here still. We have a reputation in America for being religious. S yet, the numbers are declining. And then the rise of the no religion is uh, people is very important. And then I'll get to spiritual, but not religious. So why? Why are the no religion people, why, are, why is it rising? <clears throat> well, First of all, let's bust one stereotype. It's not from people that are just easily manipulated, joining a movement, following a leader, going to a cult, uh, even a political cult. That's not the main body of people that are unaffiliated. And although they are, <clears throat> excuse me, although they're very anti-dogmatic, they aren't actually anti-religion. Many people see religion as a lifestyle choice, like you know, playing soccer or something, and it's just it's fine if you want to do it, that kind of attitude. Um, the, the increasing cultural and religious diversity we have in America is another reason why it seems like we have so many options. Why stick with one thing? Another reason is that our relative affluence and our real focus on freedom of choice has made people uh, feel like, eh, maybe I can do better. Let me look around. And then all of this <clears throat> is mixed into a context of democracy, pluralism, and consumer capitalism. And believe it or not, um, the unaffiliated, and especially the spiritual but not religious, are a real market opportunity for a lot of companies. Um, all you have to do is go to Target, go into the uh, sports equipment section, and you'll see yoga mats that are clearly marketed to a certain population. And that's Target, you know. Go to a yoga studio, and they'll be even more higher end and fancier and way more expensive. So <clears throat> what are other forces that are uh, encouraging people to swim with the tide, to go with the, get on the train, the train of no religion? Well, uh, as you well know, there's political and cultural polarization right now. And, you know, a lot of people blame uh, evangelical Christianity for that. And so they're like, I'm not going to be part of that if that's what's happening, if that's what they're doing. That's a, a segment of our population. There's also the hyper focus on personal freedom and individualism. And Jessica and I were talking about that last week when we had our conversation. And even though she and I have different um, approaches, we agreed that this is something in the U.S. that's really almost becoming a problem, you know, hyper focus on personal freedom and individualism. And that shows up, unfortunately, in uh, the, the vaccine controversy. Um, people want to claim their own authority now. 
there's a lot of anti-traditional kind of thinking now, like if it's tradition, it can't be right, it must be repressive. So people want to use their own authority. And then finally, and I'm, I know you're well aware of this, everybody, we're in a culture of skepticism, doubt, and anxiety. And that, uh, at one point, that would have uh, bred religious affiliation, but for some reason now, it's doing the complete opposite. So, um, just as a, a street cred kind of thing, I want you to know that I myself was once a spiritual but not religious person, and I wrote a book about it. It's called Bloomfield Avenue, A Jewish Catholic Jersey Girl Spiritual Journey. I actually have a poster here if I don't knock down all my other things. You can kind of see it here. So you can get this book. You can get it on Kindle. You can order it uh, from Roman Littlefield. It's very uh, easy to get. So it's called Bloomfield Avenue, A Jewish Catholic Jersey Girl Spiritual Journey. And it, 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 it um, talks, I talk about how I went from being raised by two parents of two different religions who did not practice their religion because they thought, well, if religions, if their religions don't approve of their love, then too bad. So forget the religion. Uh, so I was raised without religion, went through a big searching period, uh, was sort of a proto-spiritual but not religious person, and then um, actually became part of organized religion, and, um, and I'm actually ordained now. But um, I see both sides of the issue. So I heard so many stereotypes of uh, spiritual but not religious people that decided this isn't right. I mean, I was definitely there. And the stereotypes that they're talking about, you know, ca um, cafeteria Catholics, eclectic, all that shallow, it didn't seem right. So I decided in my research to interview and to talk to people that were SBNRs so that they would have their own voices to speak. And I interviewed hundreds and I wrote a book and um, a lot of the things I'll be saying here are from the book. And uh, it, I can't say everything in this book, so I encourage you to get a hold of a copy. Again, you can buy it on Kindle or on the publisher, which is Oxford University Press. And it's called Belief Without Borders, Inside the Minds of the Spiritual But Not Religious. I'm the author. Belief Without Borders, Inside the Minds of the Spiritual But Not Religious. And, okay, this is a little bigger than you can see, but you can kind of get an idea of it. It's a really pretty cover, so <clears throat> maybe that'll help you identify it. So, okay, finally, now we're at the spiritual but not religious. Um, they, uh, they are an interesting segment of the population. It's large. It's about 27%, which is significant. It's really significant. When you consider that um, mainstream organized relig religious affiliation has dropped below 50%, this one's coming up. This one's, you know, catching up to our tradition of affiliation, but it's now a new phenomenon of disaffiliation. Um, some people say, well, you know, okay, so we have less, or less uh, Christians, less Protestants, but, you know, other religions will take over. No, that's not what I find. Do you know that only 1% of Americans are, uh, is, are Muslim? Now, in, by 2050, it'll grow to 2.1. That's still very small. I mean, Jews are even larger than that. They're like 2.2%. Buddhists, 1%. Hindus, 1%. Mormons, maybe a little higher. So uh, it's unlikely that that will take over from, uh, from the decline. So who are these people? What's interesting about the spiritual but not religious is that they're like middle people. They're not totally against religion. They're not, um, they, they're not against it. They, they think it's interesting. They share, they, they take things from it, but they're also not affiliated. They don't want to be affiliated. So what are they? Why do they call themselves this? Well, <clears throat> what they claim is, and I'll bet you there's a whole bunch of people here in the audience that'll say, oh, right, yeah, of course, that's what it's, that's, that's how it is. Well, SBNRs say that religion is institutional, 
dogmatic, exterior, and unessential. So they say that's religion, but to be spiritual, that is personal and private and open and individualistic and core. And so they cho choose to not be part of institutional things with dogmas and buildings and budgets and all that. And they want to just house it inside their own hearts. And that's what they mean when they say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Now, there's a lot of religious people that would say they're, re they're spiritual and religious. And I hope that most people that are religious would say that because the best of religion combines both the exterior and the interior. So what else can we learn about them? Well, they are often politically progressive. They um, do not like, they have sort of an anti-institutional bent, although they participate in institutions, they pay their taxes, they have families, they're perfectly normal as far as I can tell, as much as anybody else. But um, where I found that they're, oh, they're from all different parts of the population, they're uh, they're different races, ethnicities, definitely intergenerational. Of course, more are young, more are millennial and below, but there's plenty of Gen X, baby boomers. That's a big source of SBNR is baby boomers. Um, but at any rate, uh, spiritual and not religious people are everywhere, everywhere. You can go, as I did, to a little tiny town in Minnesota, northern Minnesota, 90 miles from the Twin Cities, which is way up there. And um, you'll find a yoga studio, you'll find a bookstore with uh, sort of new age things. You'll find uh, all sorts of things that spiritual but not religious people would like. I thought it was just amazing. It's everywhere, in case you haven't noticed. I'm sure you have. Okay, so these are people in the middle ground. Uh, the thing that's in, the most interesting about them what, that I found is not what they believe, although that was interesting, it's what they agree on to not believe. And a lot of the things they agree on to not believe are things they identify with conservative Christianity. Now, if there's any more liberal or progressive uh, Christians in the audience, um, of course, you'll, uh, you'll say, wait a minute, I don't go with all that either. But SBNRs, especially those who either came out of evangelicalism or never had any contact with organized with Christianity, feel that these are things they, they decide to never believe in. One of them is exclusivism, which means my way or the highway. You know, you go my way or you're going to hell. They, they don't like that. They don't like the idea that, that there's absolute truth. They think truth is relative. They, they don't, they for some reason do not do not like the idea of a personal, intentional, involved God. Now, many of them will substitute the word universe where other people would use God, but it's a more benign, um, uh, almost distant energy source. They do not like the word sin. They, they take a modern, more modern therapeutic mentality that everyone is born good and there's no way that people were created bad which is not actually good the, good theology, but they think that's what Christians believe. They don't like the idea of heaven and they especially don't like the idea of hell. However, most of them believe in an afterlife, which is quite interesting. And, and I've got a whole variety of, um, of uh, beliefs that they have on that. They also have a wide range of beliefs, which you have to get it, go to my book, I think, to, to read it, it because it's, there's a lot of it. But they believe in, they have certain views about transcendence and imminence. Transcendence meaning apart from this world and imminence meaning in it. If they were strong on anything, it would be imminence. That the energy, if there's any kind of divinity, any kind of universe, the energy is in this world, not outside this world. What about human nature? <clears throat> As I said earlier, they believe everyone is born good and there is no um, tendency to, you know, mess up. And if they do mess, if someone does mess up, it means they're dysfunctional, they had a difficult childhood and so forth. They have certain views about community, which is that uh, lifelong commitment is not ideal. Um, a revolving door is fine, take what you like and leave the rest, that sort of thing. And then finally, um, as I said, there is a belief in life after death. 
So you might be thinking, maybe I'm one of them. Um, well, maybe you are, but it's a, it cuts across generations, but there's also types. What I found was that there were um, at least five types of SBNRs. They're not all the same, except in their beliefs, which is really amazing. In fact, a lot of the people I interviewed said they couldn't continue to go to church if that was where they were, because they didn't believe in the things I just mentioned, and they felt it was it would damage their integrity if they kept going and showing up and pretending. So they all believe that, but then there are different styles of SBNRs. And I think I'll mention that, talk a little bit about what's gonna, where are we going next, and then I'll open it up for Q&A. So they're not all the same. Here's the types I found. See where you fit, or your friends, or family, or your kids. <clears throat> Dissenters. Dissenters are those who just kind of have a bone to pick with religion. Like, you know, maybe something bad happened to them, or maybe they just thought it was boring, or they found one facet that they hated, and they decided they didn't want to stay any longer. So that was actually a small percentage. The idea that they're angry at religion did not hold up. Um, they Sometimes they couldn't care less, or they thought it was a lifestyle choice, and oh, free, everyone's free to do what they want. But um, not that many had a bone to pick with organized religion. You'd think they were ones who were hurt. People in the church think, oh, we hurt them, we hurt them. I, I didn't find much of that, believe it or not. Not that that doesn't exist, but it wasn't a dominant theme. Then the group that was the largest, the type, was what I call casuals. These people are like, well, you know, I'm a little depressed. I think meditation is supposed to help me. I'll try it. <clears throat> or I'm kind of stiff. Let me go to yoga class. But, you know, when they were done with it or they couldn't afford it anymore, it was not really working. They moved on. These are casuals. The next group I found, much smaller, were the explorers, the spiritual explorers. They were a fun group, very interesting. They basically were spiritual tourists. They liked to visit. They didn't really want to live there. They'd try this, they'd try that. It was fun, it was amusing. They weren't committing. Um, the fourth group are people I called seekers, and that was a pretty small group. That's a group that is in fact looking for a home in organized religion and just shopping until they found what they wanted. That was a pretty small group. And the smallest group were those I called immigrants. Those are people who in fact try to affiliate with a religion different from what they ever had before. And sometimes they found it really hard. I mean, to orient to some new faith, maybe it was a little, it seemed a little exotic to them, or it was just so many new habits to start. I don't mean you went from being a Methodist to a Presbyterian. I meant you, you went from being like uh, a sort of lukewarm Methodist to being a Buddhist and really trying to live the Buddhist way. One woman I interviewed said that she felt guilty because she still had an understanding of a God who intervened. And she said she was told at uh, her, her Buddhist uh, Sangha that that wasn't okay. That wasn't a good belief. It was immature. It was childish. And she had to get rid of it. And she felt terrible because she said she wanted it to be true. So she was an immigrant, but she was having a hard time. So... Let me just wrap up here and then we'll take questions. What does this mean for America? Where are we going? Um, it's going to be a rough going because as we can see in the news, you know, last few months or year, people, more and more people are disagreeing with each other. At least at one time, America had kind of a, what they called a civil religion where people go, okay, you should be honest. You should do this. You should do that. You know, and although they weren't, all coming from a religious place, people kind of agreed on these things. That is falling away. Um, diversity is ruling. Freedom of choice is ruling. People want to do things their own way. And um, that means there's going to be more disagreement. Another problem or change is that, uh, believe it or not, religions have accomplished a lot of good things. Social services, food kitchens, uh, clothing drives, all sorts of things. Religions don't just 
try to convert and get you, you know, to give money. They actually perform services for the world because that's the core of many, many religions is giving. So without, with them dwindling, we'll have less of that. Now, is America going to let government do it all? That seems to be, go rub a lot of Americans the wrong way. So if churches aren't going to do it because they can't because they're too small, and government is going to be prevented from picking up the slack, a lot of people are going to continue to fall through the cracks. Um, and there's just a lot of social capital that, organ, that organized groups provide. SBNRs tend to be somewhat suspicious of institutions, uh, not really big on committing to them. They're more, they, they're, they more believe in issues than institutions which you might say, so well, that's fine, yeah, what, whatever. But actually, history has shown that institutions can accomplish a lot more than individuals. So we may find uh, less organized help for such things as climate change, um, so, uh, social safety nets, and so forth, things that we actually, maybe all of us see, we need to deal with. So. Um, there are good things about the spiritual but not religious movement. It's freed up a lot of people. It's gotten people out from under sometimes the yoke that they really didn't want to carry. It's given people a sense that they can do whatever they want, and that's good. But it's also possibly going to be quite um, an adjustment for society because America has always had strong and large organized religious groups. So I'm really sorry about the slides and the, you know, all that, but um, hopefully I've piqued your imagination and your thoughts and uh, this will give you a whole lot to think about when you go back um, to your own practices. Okay, Jessica. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much for wonderful information. And we do have some questions in the chat here. Um, Let's see, where should we start? We'll start with the first one as they came in. Uh, this question I you may have answered. Um, Patrick says, I self-identify as both spiritual and religious. However, my religious self does not depend on going to church. Do you see this trend of SBNR as a problem in society? And I, I think you've touched on that. But if, if there's anything else that you would like to ask Patrick, feel free to unmute yourself oh. and clarify if you want to. You better unmute me because I'm I'm losing my, I lost my Zoom uh, controls. Okay, you're, you're unmuted, so you're okay. good. good. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, let me respond very briefly to that. Uh, they say often that people that there are phases in, in unaffiliation. One is believing without belonging, which is I think what Patrick was saying. Um, statistics show that that is a phase on the way to not believing or belonging. So it is very hard to sustain a faith without a community. And when people never align with the community, they t their faith tends to dwindle. It's kind of like running the car on fumes. And you need to be reminded, you need to see role models, you need to see other people, you need to be given opportunities to do things as a group. And so I think that is a large phase of people that are practicing without showing up somewhere. Of course, it's the pandemic, but you know, uh, without being part of an organized group. And I think that, um, Generally, people, their faith declines, but it could take a long time. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you, Linda. It, it seems that um, saying I'm spiritual but not religious is a kind of dialectic. It sets this up as an either or. I am spiritual or religious, and I'm coming from a place to say it's both and. I yeah. am spiritual and I am religious. And as I indicated, and, and I do sometimes go to church, but it's not something that I feel I have to do um, to get to, to enrich my, my spirituality. I just, I just wanted to note that difference. There's, a, there's a, there are two different models. One is an either or, and the other is a both and. And I don't often hear people say, 
Yes, I am spiritual and religious. Did maybe you find- you missed, maybe you missed that part, but I did say that. Um, maybe you were you uh, weren't there, weren't here, but <clears throat> I said that m- most religious people would say they are spiritual, okay. and I hope that religious people would say that because um, what w- we call spiritual now used to be called piety. And it was like, as Wesley said, you, you know, your heart strangely warmed. And so it really was meant to be the, the core of Christianity, at least, organized religion. Great. Thank you. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, we have another question here. How are spiritual, not religious, finding spiritual community? Good question. I did ask them about community. And what I found was that um, most people wouldn't mind finding a community. But they often said, I said, well, okay, good, good. What would it look like? And they said, well, everyone would be able to hold their own beliefs without being judged. And I said, well, okay. And have you ever seen a community like that? And oftentimes the person would say, "Um, well, no, because I want everyone to agree with me on this. And so a community does need some cohesion and uh, I think they just didn't want to be judged, but um, you need more than that to form a community. All right, we have another question. How do we stay together as a country if individual freedom becomes so important that we can't live in community in community in which people will hold different religious and political perspectives? Right, that's the million dollar question. How do we stay in community? How do we stay together as a nation? That's the million dollar question. Um, In history, the very sad thing that brings communities together if they don't have shared values is catastrophe. And we're certainly facing catastrophes that not everybody appreciates yet. And that's not a great way to form community, but it does happen. And, uh, but a shared, a shared set of values and standards and beliefs is probably a lot easier way. I mean, it's hard, but it's not as horrible as a catastrophe to bring us together. Those seem to be the options right now. And I think uh, we've overdone the freedom stuff. I mean, everyone freedom is like an American watchword. Okay. And everyone wants freedom. Everyone wants choice. Uh, but you can take it too far. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Um, And you answered this in, I think you answered this in a sort of a general way, but there's a little bit more specific question. To what extent did the Catholic Church's scandals play a role in the migration to SBNR? Yeah, it played some role. Um, People occasionally mentioned it. And I did have a a lot of former Catholics, and I hate this word, but they call themselves recovering Catholics. I, I think that's unfortunate. But at any rate, For some, yes, that was very important. They lost their trust. But the thing is, lack of trust, cynicism, skepticism, that's everywhere. So people don't trust. I mean, that's common not to trust any institution now. So the Catholics were just one more in the line of things you're not going to trust. But it does does make people want to turn away from organized religion. But I always say, well, you know, hypocrisy, you know, (laughs) there's... It's everywhere. It's human. So who knows if we uncovered, if we took, picked up all the rocks, how many bugs and things we'd find underneath all of them. I think that's the human condition. Um, and so is trying to be community with each other. That's part of the human condition too. Yeah. Um, I do have a question also about as a teacher of the spiritual tradition that I'm a part of, I noticed that a lot of the folks who come to this tradition, uh, which happens to be yoga, um, they are identifying as SBNRs. And I see a lot of students who come and they kind of bounce around from teacher to teacher, from lineage to lineage. Um, They may, you know, they they may bounce around quite a bit. They may be gone for a while and then they come back and they, they identify as spiritual. And as a teacher, um, there's a, a necessity to remain on a particular path in order to get to the depth of it 
that actually is spiritual. So just having a yoga mat and throwing it down on your floor and doing postures on it isn't exactly a spiritual experience all the time for every person. And so you and I have talked about this last week that in any time that somebody is kind of picking and sampling, well, I like this about Buddhism, so I'm going to bring that in. And I like this about Christianity, so I'm going to hold on to that piece of my, you know, what I grew up with. And I love this about yoga. So I'm going to bring all these things and kind of create my own spirituality. And my question is how all of these paths are a path that takes you from one place into the depth of the actual theology and, and, to, and in order to learn it. So if someone is sampling, are they getting to the depth of anything or are they just kind of sampling and um, you know, floating around the fringes without getting into the deep good stuff that, that happens if you stick with a path long enough, no matter what that path is. Well, as we spoke before, I totally agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and a lot of uh, religions, um, you get sort of pop theology and pop ideas. And if you leave it because of that, I mean, have you really dug a deep enough well to find out what's in that particular faith? Most people don't. I mean, it's hard work. It takes time. It takes effort. It's, but it's very rich and valuable. And so um, it's better, you know, the saying is it's better to dig one well deep than just look on the surface for water. You probably won't find it uh, or as rich of a vein of water unless you go deep. So even let's say, I mean, I'm very, very familiar with Christianity and people would say, well, Christianity is all about sin and anger and doom and gloom and a punishing God and all that. And I'm like, well, actually, I've gone extremely deep into it. And that's not what I find at all. So it's kind of uh, upsetting when people want to write off a tradition that they barely explored. But if you barely explore a whole bunch of things, I think you're going to end up confused, exhausted, and probably end up not really committing to anything. So I don't, you know, what is it that will grab somebody and, and help them go deep? Uh, it's, it could be a wonderful teacher. It could be something they read. I, some people never will do that. You, you just don't know. Um, but what I find is that, that going deep takes a lot of work, but it's really worth it. Yes. Thank you for that. I, I tend to agree with you on that. So, and it is, it's a lot of hard work and sometimes years of effort. And, um, I encourage anyone exploring to uh, keep that in mind. So let's talk about, uh, the question here from Christina. Can you talk about the deconstructionists? Where do they fall under SBNR types? Mm. Um, well, I didn't, that is maybe more of an academic uh, field or uh, occupation. And so um, I didn't find many people saying that they were deconstructionists or even aware of what that means. But if, the, if your main goal is to deconstruct, chances are you will not adhere or commit to something because you'll always be waiting to find out what's uh, under it and whose self-interest is going to be served by unseen forces. And so it, it does foster more distrust and skepticism and cynicism. And that's a shame. I don't think the philosophers who started this tradition meant that. I think they meant to for it to bring freedom. But um, a lot of times in, uh, you'll see students come to a university or college with one set of beliefs and they'll meet a deconstructionist perspective and end up without anything. And I heard a lot of that in my interviews, a lot. That doesn't mean college is bad. I love school and I, I'm a professor. Okay, so <clears throat> I believe in teaching, I believe in knowledge, I believe in all that information and all that. But um, if, if a person isn't gonna go deep and get really rooted in something, they'll be easily uh, shaken up. We have another question here. Um, there's a little preface to it, so I'll read that. Robert Bella called our attention to the loss of the language of the common good in his Habits of the Heart in the 1980s. Are not we moving away from all fraternal organizations and service groups? 
such as Masonic Lodges, Lions Club, American Legion, etc. So maybe SBNR is just part of a larger move away from community organizations into a growing individualism. And, and it's phrased as a question. Uh, I, I totally agree. Um, and then another scholar wrote a book called Bowling Alone. Isn't that a great title? Bowling Alone? Because, you know, bowling was usually taking place in leagues and very few people, unless they were practicing for the league, would go to the bowling alley and bowl, bowl by themselves. So that's just a symbol of the decline of uh, organizations. PTA, all sorts of things. It's hard to get people to come out for things. And the pandemic has made it worse, really. But it was already a, a problem before the pandemic. Um, I, and I think that is going to be difficult for the U.S. I think those groups were like glue. It's, it's called social capital. It's the glue that would hold people together. And without the glue, we don't hold together very well. Uh, Jonas has a question. Do you think that secular groups like Project Bread are helping to meet social needs in ways that make up for the decreasing capacity for religious institutions to do that? Um, I do think that, that those kind of groups, I know about Bread, those kind of groups are excellent. The Harmony Project, things like that. They can um, provide some some of the substance that people got from organized religion, CrossFit. Some people just uh, latch onto these things with almost a religious fervor, but that's not common. <clears throat> and so uh, NAA, for, that's another one that people really stick to. Um, I think they do make up for it to a degree, but what's, con what's uh, an energy of religion that isn't there in those other groups is a common uh, source, a common divine source. And religions have it, no matter what they call it, even if they call it non-being or nothingness. I mean, there is some kind of energy that everyone tries to partake of. Um, I don't think those other groups, the socially active groups, social activist groups are wonderful, and I'm part of many of them. I just don't think they have the holding power on people's hearts that they, that other, that faiths do. Yeah, they seem to not have um, a... They don't present a worldview yeah. that followers or believers can kind of buy into, maybe. Yeah, not only that, but um, sometimes the challenges are ta they take on are so huge and so important that it's easy to get burned out when you don't see major systemic change. Because uh, we want that for the better, for the common good. But if you just expect it and hope for it and work for it and you don't get it the way you thought you don't there's no recourse whereas in in religions in faith there is a larger power a larger energy a larger divinity that um, you hope has the common good at heart and will bring it about even if humans can't do it or with human cooperation um i have a question from grant asking uh catholic Oh, sorry. Catholic theologian Paul Knitter has written the book, Without the Buddha, I Couldn't Be a Christian. Right. How much of this kind of serious integrative spirituality have you found? Well, I, I wish I could say I found a lot. He's a brilliant scholar. I know him and his work. He can do that. Uh, most people don't have the time and the energy to even commit to one faith, much less go deep into two. If you can do it, and I know people who can, it's extremely enriching. And it brings together forces like e of East and West that we often have trouble f reconciling with each other. But um, the average person is going to have trouble doing that. Um, I mean, I was raised, my mother was Jewish, my father was an Italian Catholic immigrant, my mother was first generation immigrant. And um, did I become a, a two religion person? No, it was. I had to commit to one thing in order to grow. Now, I, I bring in elements of these other things, but um, it's hard to be two things at the same time. We're so, we're so limited. Humans are limited. But some people can do it, like Knitter, and that's brilliant. Okay. Uh, Bill says, uh, so to me, Christianity is probably an early victim of the cancel culture before it became a buzzword. What role do you think the government slash courts have played in the decline of organized religion? Well, that's a really big question. 
Um, <clears throat> we, the country is dedicated to the separation of church and state. That's a strength. That's a good thing. When religion tries to overstep the bounds of American constitution, you know, the American constitution, people get annoyed because they think religion doesn't have the right to impose itself on other people that don't agree or that are of different faiths. So um, I think the courts have been trying to preserve the separation of church and state as they should. And I don't think that they've hampered the uh, practice of faith. Uh, the Supreme Court, I think, is, is um, I hate to say this, but meddling a little more than it needed to. I think people were happier when uh, religion tried to stay out of politics. And now you could have your religion and you didn't have to declare your politics at the same time. That, I think, has become a big mistake. I have a question here. Why don't more SBNRs ultimately join liberal churches such as Unitarian Universal? Right or ethical culture, which seem to allow for a range of beliefs while still forming a unified community? Right. Excellent question. A few years ago, I was invited by the, uh, the, the leadership of the Unitarian Universalist group to speak to, to them before they had their general conference. This was when it was in Portland. And because they said, the SBNRs, they should be our people. And I said, you're right. They should be your people. You're perfect for them, but they don't want any. They don't want to be brought into an organized group. And to to them, you look like a church. <laughs> you got pews. You got you know pulpit, all that. And they don't want any part of that. So I'm really sorry because I think they'd be very happy with you. Uh, and I I've taught many Unitarians. I love them. And uh, you know I I agree with the UUs, but um, that's it's missing the boat of what uh, SBNRs are really trying to uh, to profess, which is they're not they're not interested in aligning with anything that's an organized religion, even if its theology is way more open. Okay. Do you think political organizations get deeper into spirituality of some sort than religious organizations do? as they are having more participants than religious organizations do. They are definitely getting in, they are definitely having a lot of participants and they're, um, you know, organizing people, but I don't think they go into spirituality. I think they go into ideology and ideology can unify people, but a lot of times an ideology has to have an enemy. And I don't think that's a good, um, that's a good faith stance is like, let's focus on the enemy and, you know, <laughs> doing the enemy in or something. Um, organized religion at its, at its heart should be more about love and community and um, forgiveness and finding common commonalities without having to completely agree on everything. Political groups, I think, expect a lot of uh, discipline and agreement and if you step out of line you're probably not gonna do well with that group so i don't think they're providing spirituality i really don't spirituality is like like a love affair it's a it's a of the heart uh and and the heart wants love so i don't see political ideology giving you that okay Jeanette says, could you address the difficulty regarding moving from conservative Christianity's certainty to the struggle of not knowing? Good question. Yes, it's, uh, it's an important transition. I know a lot of people that are in that transition. Certainty feels good, especially in a very uncertain world. But you can have a type of certainty even when you don't have to have absolute certainty about everything. And I don't think life really gives you absolute certainty, not this life anyway. So um, it's, it is more of a struggle, but the thing is when you have absolute certainty, you're pretty much um, walling yourself in into a very small space. And everybody on the outside of that space is either a bad person, a heretic or a challenger. And uh, that's a hard way to live. It sounds like it'd be easier, but it's sort of, it's a little more 
immature. I hope people don't take offense at that, but I think a, a mature adult knows that we can't know everything. Right. Uh, this question is, uh, are there specific writers or influencers who are associated with SBNR? Mm. Yeah, tons. Uh, tons and tons. Uh, I can't even start naming them, but there, there's a, it'll be one pop, one popular book after another that people will say, oh, have you read this? And then they'll read it. And so there is a, a whole trend of new ideas. New, it's almost like you have to generate new ideas to hold that audience. And it is an audience and people are marketing to it. Just, you know, appreciate that we are in a consumer culture. So um, you, you need to go online and, and because there's just so many popular books that people just transition through. Um, I don't know. It's just Oprah. You know, go to Oprah. She'll give you the books. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. That's a good answer. That's a really good answer. I like it. Um, I had a question uh, about your work and when you started in this work, was it just purely research on your part out of your own curiosity or were you um, diving in deep into this topic as a way to help people? Well, as a, as a minister, I, do, I always want to help people. That's my first and top goal. That's why I became a professor, because it's not the most lucrative thing you could do, nor is it the most popular thing to teach theology. People like walk away and they, you know, you meet them at a party and you tell them you teach theology and they're like, you know, um, oh, wait a minute, I need to get something to eat. I'll be back. Then they're not. So it, it's not a popular thing to do. Um, but I, so I, I took that burden on six years to get a PhD, you know, a master's degree, all that stuff. It took forever, 13 years to get educated, to do it. I did it because I wanted to help people because I went through my spiritual, but not religious phase. I went through an athe. I was an atheist for a while. I was spiritual, but not religious for a long time. And when I finally just made the decision to commit to the thing that seemed the most reasonable to me, a lot of things, it, a lot of things fell into place. I felt like a whole person. And I, before I didn't know, was I Jewish? Was I Christian? Was I nothing? What was I? Um, uh, things fell into place when I made a decision to commit, but I didn't commit superficially. I committed to go in deep. And so um, I was just hoping to help other people find something like that too. And if my students said they, weren't unha they were unhappy because for instance, let's say they were United Methodist, but they were gay and they couldn't come out and all that, I'd say, change, go become a UU, become a UC, United Church of Christ. There's plenty of places that would accept you. So I wanted them to have something with depth in it. And that's what I've been aiming for all along. So my, I, most of my research isn't just out of curiosity. I researched spiritual but not religious because I was one and I thought they were being uh, misrepresented in the popular press and even in the, in the church. I thought they were just not being given a hearing. So that's why I did it. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have any final questions? Um, you can either type it in the chat or uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask it live. It is eight o'clock, so we're about to wrap up, but I don't want to miss anybody's questions here. Um, maybe you could mention that I have a website. So if people want to read my blogs or they want to um, learn more, they could go to www.healthybeliefs.org. I have a Facebook page for Healthy Beliefs. Uh, I have a Twitter account. Uh, I use LinkedIn all the time, and I'm always posting new articles about this movement. That's my main goal is just education, just sheer education and helping people make some decisions in their own lives. And I also do, uh, I'm a, a guest lecturer, I preach, I, uh, take, I teach courses, so I'm available if you want to uh, reach out to me. And my email is lindamergadante at healthybeliefs.org, and I'll be happy to take additional comments at that, uh, at, at that email site or on my website. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who is here. Um, the Interfaith Center is offering programs almost every week now, sometimes two a week. And the next program we have is October 19th. It's called Living with Grief from COVID-19. So we'll be looking at 
societal grief as well as individual grief that comes from both death losses from COVID and non-death losses from COVID. And then on November 2nd, we have a program called Green Burial. So we're gonna look into environmentally friendly burial options. And on November 9th, we have Values Driven Marketing with Kylie Slavic. So we'll be looking at uh, conscious ways to market your business or your personal service for those people who don't like marketing. So um, I hope to see you all then. Thank you again so much for being here and have a wonderful night.